Well, once again, we are going to dive back into God's Word today, and we continue our series, The Unlikely God Above the Chaos. How many like a good underdog story? Anybody like a good underdog story? I was trying to think of some, some good underdog story, some good underdog story movies, and uh, one of the old movies that came to my mind that I think is a great underdog story is Rudy. How many love the movie Rudy, the kid, the football player from Notre Dame. I think, I think that's a, a good one. Another's Karate Kid. Anybody remember that movie back from uh, the 80s and 90s? I don't know, 80s or 90s, something like that. Karate Kid, you know, that kid that just gets trained by Mr. Miyagi, right? <laughs> Miyagi son. Um, that's my best impression. It's terrible, but that's okay. And then you got the Rocky Balboas, except for like Rocky, like five or four, whichever one of those that really was like terrible. Um, but, you know, the first couple were really good. You know, especially when he's against Drago or Mr. T, uh, you know, those kind of things. But, uh, uh, and then there's Miracle, the, the, the U.S. hockey team, the college team going up against the big bad USSR, right? They're not supposed to win. And what a, uh, what a phenomenal uh, movie that is. But, you know, as a college basketball fan, and I'm a college basketball fan. I love college basketball. My team, Duke, is not doing very well this year, although they did win uh, this past weekend, so that was good. Uh, but, uh, but I love college basketball. The NCAA tournament, March Madness, is coming up, and it got me thinking about a, an, a, a, an underdog story back in, in 1983. NCAA men's basketball uh, champion, North Carolina Wolfpack. The North Carolina Wolfpack, they were led by then coach Jim Valvano. And if you know anything about the story or if you remember, some of you might remember, it's a true underdog story. So for those of you that might not be familiar, let me just kind of set the stage a little bit. Uh, the, the, the Wolfpack were not r- highly ranked at all. In fact, they'd gone through the regular season with a record of 17 and 10, and, uh, and really they weren't even going to make the NCAA tournament. The only way they could get into the NCAA tournament that year was to win the ACC championship in which they were the fourth or fifth best team, depending on uh, who you talked to at that time, uh, within just the ACC itself. So they weren't expected to win even the ACC, but they started out the ACC uh, tournament, and, uh, and, and, and they again, the fifth best team, and uh, they had to go up against teams like North Carolina, who at that time had Michael Jordan, and they had to go up against uh, Virginia, who had Ralph Sampson on the team. So this was a, a stack tournament, and they were the underdogs, and so they went on in the first round. They beat Wake Forest uh, 71-70. They went on to beat North Carolina in overtime 91-84. Then number two, Virginia with Ralph Sampson. They beat 81-78. And uh, the, the thing about Virginia, they had already beat them twice in the regular season. And, uh, and so they went on to win the ACC tournament, which then gave them a spot in the NCAA tournament. It was a 52-team tournament at that time, and if you know, they break it down into four categories. They were a 12 seed, which is not a very good seed when they went into that. And, uh, and so they opened by playing Pepperdine. NC State surprisingly went on to beat Pepperdine 69-67 in double overtime, and they began to get the name the Cardiac Pack. NC State then faced UNLV, and they went on to beat UNLV 71-70 by one point, pulling off another miraculous finish. And then they beat Virginia again, who they faced for the fourth time by one point, 63-62. They went on again to, to beat Georgia, and they found themselves in an unlikely position. They were now in the NCAA championship game, but they were up against Houston. And you have to understand about Houston at that time. Houston was the number one team hands down. They had the best record that year. They were hands down the number one team. In fact, they had a duo of Clyde Drexler and Hakeem Olajuwon, and they were known as Phi Jamma Slamma. That was their nickname. So this is who they were going up against. And so there they are in the championship game. They are the underdog of underdogs. And, uh, and, and truly, it came down with 44 seconds left on the clock. They have the ball. They're dribbling down. And, and there is, they're trying to find a shot. There's not a shot. All of a sudden, a heave of desperation. Shot goes up. And right before the buzzer, they got an offense of what was supposed to be uh, what looked like it was going to be an air ball, then became a slam dunk by Lorenzo uh, Charles with an incredible buzzer beater, 54-52. It was a Cinderella story that plays over and over again during March Madness. 
And why do I share that? Because one of the things that I love about the Bible is the Bible is filled with underdog stories. The Bible is filled with underdog stories. The Bible is filled with people who are underdogs, who are not expected to really be able to do anything, up, up against incredible odds. And today, we're going to look again at Gideon. Not only is Gideon an underdog himself, but the nation that he was a part of, the nation of Israel, in this story is also an underdog against a, 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 an enemy that had lined up against them, and a nation called the Midianites. They were a powerful nomadic people that we talked about last year who had oppressed the Israelites for seven years. So for seven years. In fact, this is what it says, Judges 5 and 6, just for review today. They came up with their livestock, their tents like swarms of locusts. I mean, that's just a lot of people, isn't it? Swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. So Midian impoverished the Israelites so much that they cried out to the Lord for help. How many of you know that's a good thing to do when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling like an underdog, right? To call out to the Lord for help. And to understand the context, again, Israel had cycled away from God as they had done. They had sinned against the Lord. They had cried out to God for help. And God was raising up a deliverer by the name of Gideon. God appears to Gideon. And Gideon is an unlikely hero because he's fearful. He lacks courage. In fact, there's so much fear that when the angel of the Lord shows up, he is threshing wheat in a wine press just to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel says to him, uh, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior, he questions whether God is with them and how all of this stuff could happen and, and whether God could truly be with them. And then when he gets called, he says, listen, I can't go. I'm the, I'm the, my tribe is, is Manasseh. My clan is the, is the least. My family's the least. And I'm the least in my family. There is no way that it could be possible for you to choose me. And yet God called Gideon and saw things in Gideon that Gideon didn't see in himself, and God called it out of him. And Gideon responded by allowing the Lord to work inside of him and challenged him to remove the idol worship to Baal that was happening right in his very own backyard, right in his home. You see, what we discovered last week is that oftentimes God will allow pain to get our attention. God will allow pain to get our attention. And that's just because he loves us, because he sees more in us than we see in ourselves. And God wants to call that out of us, what he has created, what he has knit together in our, in, in our mother's womb, the masterpiece, the workmanship that we've been created in Christ Jesus. He wants to pull and draw that out of us. And he's calling to us. He's, he's wanting us to give him an opportunity to reveal himself to us. But there also, God wants to use us publicly. But to do that, we've got to take care of the things that are happening privately. You see, understand, Gideon was not brave. You don't have to start out as brave. Gideon was not brave. He did not have courage. But as Pastor J.D. Greer once said, God doesn't call the brave. He makes those brave who he calls. He makes those brave who he calls. You see, in our next part of the story, God is about to move in Gideon to now into a public setting where Gideon is going to lead the armies of Israel against the Midianites. He's going to call the armies of Israel and lead them up against the Midianites. Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 33, tells us what happens next. Now all the Midianites, um, Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces. So it's not just the Midianites. Now they brought in the Amalekites. They brought in other eastern peoples. And they crossed over the Jordan, and they camped in the valley of Jezreel. And the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew the trumpet, summoning the Abizarites to follow him. That's, that's his clan. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh. That's his tribe calling them to arms and also into Asher, Zebulon, and Naphtali. Those are some surrounding uh, tribes. So they went, they too went up to meet him. So again, they, they've, been, they've been impoverished for seven years by the Midianites and the Amalekites, and, and now they join forces and they cross over and they're getting ready to ravage Israel. And God says, this is the time. Enough is enough. My people has cried out for help. Gideon, you're going to lead this army. Blow the trumpet and call the people. And he started with his, his own clan, and then he started with his own tribe, and then he, he gathered together the surrounding tribes, and he began to call them together into the, the valley. Valley Jordan, uh, across the Jordan, the Valley of Jezreel. And you know what's significant about the Valley of Jezreel? That in Revelation, 
The Valley of Jezreel is also known as the Valley of Armageddon. You see, this is not just what is pictured in the Old Testament as a physical battle. It's really what we see in the New Testament as a spiritual battle. There is a spiritual battle that is taking place and one that is going to take place and the enemy seems to line up and say, you have no chance. Why do you even try? And God says, come on, come on, summon the armies. Summon the armies. Spiritual battle. But I love what happens. It says this. It says that the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. You know what I love about that? Because if you really read it literally, this is what it says literally. The Spirit of the Lord clothed himself in Gideon. Don't you love that picture? The Spirit of the Lord clothed himself in, uh, within Gideon. I, I love that because I think that's the picture that we see in the New Testament. That, that when, when, the, when, when those in the New Testament are filled with the Holy Spirit, literally the Holy Spirit just begins to say, I, I clothe myself with them in his power. I don't know about you, but I want to be clothed with the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to live inside of me and to clothe himself and to work in me and work through me. Understand, friends, God wants to fill you with this Holy Spirit. And you got to understand that if we're going to be effective against the enemy in this spiritual battle, the enemy of our soul, then we need to allow the Holy Spirit to clothe himself within us. It is not our effort or our strength, but it is the Holy Spirit working inside of us and through us as we surrender ourselves to him. God is looking for some people who will surrender and say, clothe me. Come on, Holy Spirit. Come on, Holy Spirit. Clothe yourself with me. We maybe need to ask ourselves, Lord, am I willing to be your suit of clothes today? So Gideon blows this trumpet, and what happens, 32,000 show up. 32,000, but you have to understand that among armies, armies of the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern peoples that are like locusts that swarm, and you can't even count their, their, you can't even count their camels, they're still underdogs at 32,000. They're still underdogs. But today I want to talk to you about some secrets some secrets to having an underdog faith. Secrets to having an underdog faith that we see right here in Judges chapter 7. And the first is this. When God wants to use us, he will often weaken us. When God wants to use us, he will often weaken us. Look what happened. Gideon, Judges chapter 7, verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Lest Israel boast over me saying, my hand has saved me. Again, 32,000, they're still underdogs. But God says this, the army is too many. But notice what he says, the army is too many. Not for you, the army is too many for who? For me. God says the armies are too many for me. Again, Israel, the, the Amalekites and Midianites, they were like locusts, they had swords. Israel didn't have swords, they were still underdogs. But God says 32,000, if Israel wins, they're going to boast. They're going to say, look what we did. God says, no, I can't have that. Too many for me. Too many for me. Friends, numbers are not an issue for God. Numbers are not an issue for God. Why? Because difficulty must be measured by the capacity of the agent doing the work. By the capacity of the agent. So, so the agent doing the work, it, it, it doesn't matter about the, the numbers. It, it matters about the agent. It matters about the one who, who has the, the numbers doing the work. If you believe that God's doing the work, then you have to understand that nothing is too difficult for the Lord. But if you're trusting your own resources and strength, two things can happen. Either you're going to be afraid, I don't have enough resources, this is too big, I can't do this, there's no way we can ever accomplish that, there's no way I can ever take that step of faith, it's just too much, I don't have it, I can't do it, and fear begins to take over. Or, the other area is pride. Now, I can handle that. Doesn't matter the numbers, I got that, I can do that, I can handle that. It's either pride or fear, both in the same both really under the same banner, two sides of the same coin. God's trying to teach Israel, listen Israel, the numbers aren't as important as your trust in me. 
And in order for him to teach them to trust in him, he had to begin to weaken them. And so we see what happens. Judges 7 and verse 3, Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Look what happened. They went 32,000. 22,000 of the people returned. 10,000 remained. How many know that's a lot of people to leave? So 32,000, and he says, anybody who's afraid, if you're afraid, you know what, go ahead and leave. Why? Because fear is catchy, isn't it? The moment of the battle starts to get difficult, the moment they start to look like they're losing and there's already fear in the hearts of people, that fear is something that gets catchy. Now that might be one of the reasons, this might have been a test of, of courage in that way. But, but here he is, if you're, free, if you're afraid, go ahead and, and, and leave. And if I'm Gideon at that point, I see 22,000 walking away, I'm thinking, okay, God, that's me too, I'm out of here. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, God, that's me. And God says, no, not you. <laughs> not you. Not you. There's 10,000 that are remaining. And then, and that's not enough. Look at, look at, he weakens it even more, starting in verse 7. The Lord said to Gideon, take the people, the people are still too many. What do you mean, 10,000? Come on, we had 32,000. Do you see how big this army is, God? What do you mean? At 10,000, we're not going to be able to brag. Certainly you can get the glory. He says, no, 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 no. The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I'll test them there. Uh, test, you, er, er, ha, test them for you there. Anyone whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone who I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps water with his tongue, as a dog laps, you shall set, him, set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink, and the number of those who lap, putting their hand in their mouths, was 300 men. But the rest of the people knelt down to drink the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, with 300 men who have lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand, lest all the others go, every man to his own home. So we go now from 32,000 to 22,000 to 10,000 to 300 to 300 i i look through like a bunch of different resources it's amazing to me how many different opinions there are on the, what the what the the kneeling down and what the lapping with your tongue by bringing your hand up somebody said it was it was a matter of being aware versus getting down on your knees and not being able to keep an eye on the enemy i have no idea i just kind of liken to the fact that i think god likes dogs more than cats Just saying, just saying. That's Pastor Aaron commentary. No, I, I don't, I honestly don't. For whatever reason, whatever the reason is, the, the true reason is this. God said, you know what? I can overcome a great enemy like that with 300 because numbers are not an issue for me. You see, in order for us to be used by God, what we have to understand is that sometimes God will start to weaken us. God will start to take some things away. Sometimes we'll experience a loss. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one, and we go, God, why? I don't understand. Why, why is it like this? Sometimes it's the loss of a job, or, or maybe we, we, we don't get that promotion, or maybe we have to take a pay cut, and we go, God, I don't understand. Why is this happening? And, and there are certain times in our lives where it seems as if God starts to, to, to let some things go. We, we seem like we're getting in a position where, where there's weakness, and we go, God, I don't understand, but let me help you understand something. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord, and just because God starts to strip away something, and things what he's trying to teach us is i'm your resource you can trust me if i'm going to use you i want to get the glory and the honor and so sometimes god will start to take some things away cory ten boom holocaust survivor said this you'll never know god is all you need until god is all you have aw tozer he said this it's doubtful whether god can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply Friends, if dependence is the objective, then weakness is the advantage. The Apostle Paul learned this, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Who boasts in their weaknesses? 
When you go into a job interview and they say, well, give me your strengths and your weaknesses, we kind of figure out, okay, what weaknesses do I really want to tell them and what do I really want to say because I, I really want to come off as, as you know, that I, that I have it, so how can I say this and with our weaknesses? Paul says, no, I boast in my weaknesses. Why? Because he learned that in his weakness, that's when the power of God shows up. That in humility and in weakness and in areas where we go, I, oh, I don't know, I just can't do that. When we stand there like Moses and we go, oh God, I'm at the fire, what, the, you know, uh, the, the burning bush and I'm going, oh, I don't know, you really want to use me, but I don't speak that well. I kind of stutter. God, I'm not your man. God says, no, 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 yes you are because in your weakness I will show up. Like Gideon who said, I'm the weakest in my family. God says, that's perfect because that's where I'll clothe, my spirit will clothe itself in you and you will see my power at work. First Peter 1, 7, Peter learned this. He said, these have come so the proven genuous of your faith have greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. We're stripped of everything that perishes and it's here that we have reason to praise because it's here that we begin to see God begin to work and we lean into his strength. Hudson Taylor, the great China missionary, said God wants you to have something better than riches or gold and that is a helpless dependence on him. A helpless dependence on him. Second secret of underdog faith as we move through is that God sends salvation not through human power, but through the weakness of humble obedience. The weakness of humble obedience. Again, King continuing this idea of God working through weakness. So he begins to, to strip us so that, so that we can be used by him and we see him strip us down to weakness. But then it takes humble obedience in the midst of the, of the weakness. As we learn humble obedience to the Lord, that is how salvation begins to come. So Judges 7, 8, so the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Below him in the valley. So there in the valley is the camp of Midian. And, and they have the high position. So they have a chance to just see how vast this army is. And he sends them all to their tent. And he begins to bring them. And what we see at this juncture is we see Gideon humbly obeying the Lord. So he, he, he obeys the Lord by blowing the trumpet and calling the people. 32,000 show up. God says, that's too many for me. I, I, I want you to tell anybody who's afraid to go home. 22,000 leave. Then at 10,000, Gideon has to obey the Lord again when God says, listen, that's still too many. And it gets down to 300. I don't know about you, but it's going to be very difficult to obey the Lord at that point God every time I obey you you take more away every time I obey you more leaves I don't understand that doesn't seem success at least not in American culture in American culture when you take a step like that and you see uh, you know you see things start to go down all of a sudden the bottom line goes down all of a sudden you know there's not enough uh, people that are showing up to your store you're not selling up or making enough sales we go that's a failure but see this isn't it this isn't he has to obey the Lord and that's the skyline view. In fact, if we take a look at, at, at Judges as a whole, it starts out with this strong military leader by the name of Joshua. And then you see another military leader, but he's older. His, he, his unlikely is older by the name of Othniel. From Othniel who led Judah, now we move to Ehud, who was a left-handed weak leader. Shamgar, who was an outsider. Deborah, a woman and prophet and, and a judge and Jael, a housewife from Israel. And we go from armies and then we begin to move to individuals. And here we have Gideon, who's the least in his family, the, the lowest in his tribe. And next week, we're going to see Samson. And Samson is somebody who's an individual. He's not even leading an army. He individually is being used by God against the Philistines. And he starts out with great strength, but ends in what appears to be great weakness. And then you move into the kings, and what do you find? That God calls a shepherd boy. And when the rest of the army is trembling by a giant by the name of Goliath, you have a shepherd boy who only comes with a sling and a stone. No armor, no sword, no military battle training, and yet God uses the shepherd boy to take down a giant because he was willing to humbly obey 
And all of these stories point us to the fact that in our human weakness, we can. But there's a deliverer who is coming, and his name is Jesus. And look at the way Jesus came. Jesus is shown in weakness. The Son of God washing the feet of those who would later betray him, deny knowing him, and scatter. Jesus, who during his trial was maligned and mocked and spit upon and slapped, and when it came down to carrying his cross to the very place of crucifixion, was not even able to carry it by himself, but they had to bring somebody else along to help him carry his cross. The Son of God, the Deliverer, the Mighty One in power, humbling himself in weakness. The ultimate picture of surrender, arms spread, on a cross he saved others can he save himself and you think the one who has the power to call legions from heaven to rescue and to deal and to judge does not but in humble obedience and perceived weakness dies on a cross but as we know it was not over in fact it was because of the place of surrender and weakness that Jesus Christ then rose from the grave three days later the stone moved away ultimately taking away the power of death from the enemy and the power of judgment for those who put their faith in him come on humble obedience and the power of God you know all too often we're kind of like the story I heard of a woodpecker the woodpecker was was uh, you know he he was he was just pecking away at this this telephone pole, and he's just going away tap 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 day in and day out tap 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 tap, tap. and one day he's tap tap tapping away and all of a sudden there's a lightning strike that hits the telephone pole and splits it in two and he is blowing back for a moment and he's flapping his wings and trying to to get his senses and looking at what happened and he. He looks for a moment, he sees the telephone pole just split, and he goes and he gathers all of his woodpecker friends, and he comes back and he shows them, and he goes, look what I did. <laughs> humble, faithful obedience, friends. But when we humble ourselves before God, we never know when God's going to move in his time. So let me encourage you, in humble obedience and your weakness, just be faithful. Tap, 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 tap. Just be faithful. And that's what we see is that, that Gideon is being faithful. Okay, God, I called the army. Oh, 32,000 is too many. I don't know how that's possible, but I'll obey you. Anybody fearful? Go away. 22,000. Oh, okay, I don't know, man. Now I'm, now I'm down to 10,000. You want me to take them? You're going you're gonna to take more away? Oh, wow, we're down to 300. 300? I, I don't understand. And at this point, Gideon is, is faltering a little bit in his faith. We see that in the story. Take a look, because what we see, number three, is that God patiently deals with faltering faith. Look at this, verse 9. The same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. Do you see where Gideon's faltering a little bit? I don't know about you, but I'd be faltering too. <laughs> I, I'm already nervous, and now God has taken my army of 32,000, which I already felt was outnumbered because we don't even have swords or anything, and, and now I'm down to 10,000, and, and then and then that wasn't enough, and now I'm down to 300, and he's telling me we're going to go up against this vast army, and I'm up here, and I'm looking down there, and I'm seeing how vast they are, and I'm turning around, and I got 300, and I'm thinking, how are we going to do this? And God says, listen, Gideon, if you're afraid, if you're afraid, here's what I want you to do. Go down into the camp. You see, we see Gideon struggling with faith. And we see God patiently offering to strengthen his faith. In fact, Judges chapter 6, 36 to 40, 
Uh, when, when, when God had, had called Gideon to, to do this, what we see before Gideon even acts, before he, even the, the 32,000, he says, God, if this is you, can I put a fleece out? And, and if I put this fleece out and, and the fleece is wet, but the rest of the ground around it is dry, I know it's you. And, and then if the fleece is dry, but the rest of the ground around it, I, 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 it, it is wet, then I'll know it's you. And God patiently works to confirm his word because he sees some of the, the fault in, in, in Gideon's faith. I know so often I've preached and we hear sermons of you've got to have great faith. You've got to have great faith. You've got to have great faith. And friends, I believe that God wants us to grow in our faith. I believe that God does want us to grow in that place where we can have great faith. But there are seasons and there are times, particularly as God begins to strip things away or, or begins to move things away and we, we struggle with our weaknesses, that sometimes we can begin to struggle to obey and trust the Lord. But friends, God is not up there going, oh, bad he's saying come on let me invite you let me show you some things let me show you some things let me help you with your faltering faith let me help to work and bring faith into your heart i'm reminded of mark chapter 9 where where a father comes to the disciples and, and his son has, has, is often cast into a fire, demon-possessed, and, and the disciples can't cast it out. And Jesus just comes down with his disciples from the Mount Transfiguration. He comes down, and, and this is what the father says to Jesus. He says, you know, hey, my, my boy's been like this. Jesus says, well, how long has he been like this? And the, the father says, from childhood, and he answered. And then he says this, if it, it is often thrown to the fire and the water to kill him. And look at this, but if you can do anything, this is the Father to Jesus. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can. That doesn't sound like much faith. If you can. I'd have been tempted. If I'm Jesus, I'm listen, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. All right? The Bible says if you ask anything in my name, you've got you to ask with faith, with confidence. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus invites him. Look at, the, look at what Jesus says. Jesus says if, if you can. He, he, he doesn't sidestep if you can but then he says this everything is possible for the one who believes you see jesus recognizes this and it's it's not a rebuke as much as it is an invitation to believe a reminder of what god can do a reminder that god can move in impossible situations because he is god and 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 and, and what do we find what, what does the father explain? It says immediately the boy's father said, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Anybody ever been there before? Like I have seen, I know I do believe, but there's a part of me that is struggling right now. I believe, but oh, help my doubt, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. What does Jesus do? Jesus delivers the boy. Jesus heals the boy. That tells us something about who Jesus is. His compassion and his love and his invitation to, to, to help us to believe when our faith is faltering. But here, number, number four, we got to move into this. Here, number four, because we learn something here. It's not just what God says to Gideon, don't be afraid, but it's what God asks Gideon to do next. And that is oftentimes what God asks us to do when our faith is faltering. God says, you know what, here it is, number four, at some point you have to take a risk. At some point, you have to take a risk. At some point, you have to trust me. At some point, you have to take a step of faith. And, and, and that's what we find here. The, the risk is this. He says to Gideon, if you want confirmation, if you're afraid, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down into the camp. Go ahead and take your servant and sneak down into the camp, and it's there that you'll get the confirmation. Now, why is that a step of faith? Because if I'm afraid, the last thing I want to do is to go down into the camp of an enemy army where they're all armed, and I'm not. The last thing I want to do is not at least bring my army, just me and one other person, and we got to try to sneak down in. I don't know about you, but in the midst of the darkness, because this was at night, in the midst of in the darkness and in the midst of the danger, God invited Gideon and said, if you want the confirmation, then you've got to take a step of faith and get down into the camp. And oftentimes it's dangerous. The step of faith is risky. The thing that God invites us to do before we're going to get the confirmation is risky. But listen, that is where what God will reveal to us and give us the confidence when we're willing to take the risk and the step of faith. James 4, 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Who? Where's the onus first? You, draw near to God. 
Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Because as you take a step of faith, when God invites you to do it, when you take that step of faith, it is there that he will reveal the next step. God doesn't give us the big picture all at once. He simply gives us the next step. Maybe the next step for you, you haven't been reading the Bible, but maybe God is saying, you know what, why don't you download that YouVersion Bible app and get a Bible plan and start reading the Bible every day. Maybe that's your step of faith. Maybe it ought to be to invite somebody else to read it along with you and do a plan together to help hold you accountable and help you to grow. Maybe your step of faith is saying, you know what, I'll join a life group. I'll, just, I'll move beyond just coming on a Sunday morning and I'll get into community and I'll join a small group. I'll join a life group. Maybe that's your step of faith. Maybe your step of faith is, you know what, Lord, I've been asked to serve, but I haven't felt like I have the gifts or like I can do it. And maybe your step of faith is simply saying, yes, I'll serve. What is the step of faith that God is asking you to take? That was the case for Gideon. So look what happens. Gideon takes the step of faith into the place of danger. God reveals his plan. Verse 13, when Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade and said, behold, I dreamed a dream. And behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, There's no other, this is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. God has given him into his hand Midian and all the camp so Gideon gets the confirmation from this and then it says this as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation he worshiped you see he took a step of faith he took a risk God revealed himself and he worshiped he returned to the camp strong in his faith arise for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand it wasn't until he was willing to take the step of faith and take the risk before he received the confirmation that gave him confidence that God was with them that God was going to do it so what is the risk that God is asking you to do I love it because it says that the, the dream says that it was a barley loaf and we're not talking about a tornado or hurricane a sword something like that in the dream a barley loaf a barley loaf that was Gideon you're a barley loaf so let me encourage you friends you can be a barley loaf and God will use you God uses barley loaves all right God uses barley loaves why the strength wasn't in Gideon's power but it was going to be the power of God through Gideon it's not about our own strength our own power our own talent it's about God's power working through us fifthly God can turn weakness into strength this is the last one God can turn weakness into strength Verses 16 to 18, he divided the 300 men into three companies, put trumpets in the hands of all of them, and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to the men, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me then blow the trumpets uh, also on every side of the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. To fully appreciate this, you need to remember again, Israel has no sword, all right? What, what do they come? The details sound strange. They have an empty jar. There's a torch inside the empty jar, and they're given a trumpet. There's 300 of them. He divides them into companies of 100 each, and they all begin to, to get on different sides of the, of the multitude of the armies in the valley. And that's where they are. They begin to, to line up. You have to understand that this 300 represents three companies, usually three battalions, and the trumpet usually signified an entire battalion. And this is what happened. So Gideon and the hundred men who were the three hundred or the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. And when they had just set the watch, they blew the trumpets, smashed the jars with their hands. The three companies blew trumpets and broke the jars. They held it in their left hand with the torches, and in their right hands with the trumpets they blew, and they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran. They cried out, and they fled you say what is going on here let me let me let me explain it all right so it's the middle watch of the night all right that's about 3 a.m. so at this point in the middle watch you have the first watch that has been out they've already been out it's late they're coming back at 3 a.m. so they basically the second shifters you know they they are they are late but they're coming back at 3 a.m. this group in the middle watch is just waking up all right they're just waking up and and there's another group that's for the third watch they're still asleep so understand what happens. Gideon and his men surround at night. They surround. And they have, they have trumpets, and they have these jars, and there's torches inside. 
So all at once, with all around the outskirts of the camp, and, and, and it could represent, they didn't know how many of the armies of Israel had. All of a sudden, you know, it looks like a battalions. They're all around the camp, and, and at once, they blow their trumpets at, at the third watch. They blow their trumpets at 3 a.m. in the morning, blow their trumpets, and then they all smash their jars. And when they smash their jars, the sounds of the jars sounds like a lot of soldiers pulling up their swords. And then all of these lights suddenly come on all around the camp. And you have an army that is the, the first watch army coming back, the second watch army, the middle watch army in the middle of the night waking up. So they're groggy from waking up. They're tired from falling asleep. There's others that are asleep. And so these, this army is returning back to the camp from the watch. And, and at the sound of the trumpet, every, and the middle watch people are groggy and just waking up. So they think an army is attacking. It's really their own own army. They start fighting their own army. The middle watch, or the, the, the people who are asleep wake up. What is going on? They see armies. They can't make it out who's fighting. There's a lot of confusion in the camp. And there it is. The third just stand there and watch the armies run and flee and defeat themselves. Isn't that like God? And the amazing thing is it doesn't say anywhere, and maybe it was, but it doesn't say anywhere that God said, Gideon, here's your battle plan. It wasn't until... Gideon found himself in a place of weakness that he was able to pivot. If at 32,000, he'd have had a different battle plan. But with only 300, he had to get creative. And in his creativity, what would be perceived as a weakness became a strength. See, sometimes God brings us to a place of weakness so that he can begin in faith to demonstrate his power and so he can get us to begin to think differently. What we perceive as weakness, God can turn into strength. Sometimes God must strip us of the very things that he has because he has a better plan. He gets the glory and we see a better way. God will strip us of some things so that he can reorient our thinking. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. See, God brought Gideon the victory in Israel while they were underdogs. And friends, God wants us to learn some lessons. So here's my question for you. Is there any area in your life where you feel God has been weakening you to teach you to depend on Him? You see, God's inviting us to surrender and humbly obey Him today. Is there an area where you're struggling with your faith? You're struggling in an area and God says, you know what, I'm patient with you. You need God to be patient. You need God to encourage your faith today. Will you give your, faith, your doubts to the Lord? Will you give your fear to the Lord today and take a step of faith towards Him? Friends, what's that step of faith? What's that risky place? Is there something risky that God is wanting you to take today? Is there a, a risky step? Is there a step that God is saying, I want you to take, and you go, ooh, I don't know about that. And God's saying, come on, come on. I want to invite you in. I want to invite you in. Will you surrender to the plan of God that he has for your life today? He wants to grow your faith. He wants to fill you with the Spirit. He wants to demonstrate his power through you. Let's bow our heads. Is there anyone here you say, you know, I, I need to take a step of faith towards God today. I need to take a step of faith towards God today. Maybe, maybe you're at the place where you say, you know what, I've not, I've not surrendered my life to Jesus today. And that's the place to start. Or maybe you did, but you walked away and you want to recommit your life to the Lord today. Whether you're watching online or in here, if that's you, you want to surrender your life to Christ today or recommit your life, will you slip up your hand today? I want to lead you in a saving play, faith in Jesus Christ. Will you let us know online if that's you today? Secondly, maybe you're here today and you say, you know, God's been prompting me and there's a step of faith he wants me to take. God's been prompting me to take a step of faith. Pastor, will you pray with me that, that, that I'll have the courage to take the step of faith that God's calling me to? If that's you, will you slip up your hand or let us know online? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's pray. Father, we know that you work through weakness. We know, God, that you work in our lives, that you take the very weakness that we have and you work in that. We pray, Father, for the power of your Holy Spirit to help us, Lord, with the steps of faith that you're inviting us into. Father, for those that are surrendering their lives to you, we ask you, Lord, to forgive us and cleanse us today. Holy Spirit, we ask you to move in our lives. Jesus, come into our lives today and save us today. We surrender our lives to you. Father, for those that need to take a step of faith, I just pray, Jesus, you'll give the courage. 
that you'll work with faltering areas and faltering faith and you'll give the courage God to just do what you're calling us to do and to take that step even though it's risky father we thank you and bless you today in Jesus name amen